Good to be here. Always good to be here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Matt's Art Chat. Uh, I'm Matt Mikuchi, and this is my regular series of podcast conversations about the arts. In this episode, I will be joined by London's Guildhall Art Gallery curator, Katty Pierce, for a conversation about the Enchanted Interior, a major exhibition dedicated to artworks from the past 200 years or so. Uh, that capture women in a domestic setting with a strong emphasis on female art. Um, The exhibition was recently moved online in response to the pandemic, and I will leave a link in the description of whatever platform you may be listening or watching uh, this podcast on, uh, where you can experience uh, these artworks from the comfort of your own home. It's kind of an ironic thing to say about this exhibition, but there you have it. Fascinating conversation, and I hope you will enjoy listening to it. So without further ado, let's begin. Hello, Katty. Hi, hello. <laughs> Well, it's great to hear you. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to do this. I really appreciate you taking the time. No, thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the enchanted interior at the Guildhall Art Gallery in London. I visited the gallery in the past and I've always found it to be a delightful space for art. So first of all, I'm currently in Prague, so I presume you're in London at the moment. Is that correct? I, I am. Yeah, I'm in London. I'm in my flat. I'm staying at home and yeah. uh, doing my bit. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. So what is the situation there anyways? And how are you getting through it? Um, I mean, it's good. I'm I'm uh, lucky enough to be able to work from home. And uh, if, if one of the great ironies, you know, I think that a lot of us are finding at the galleries that we've actually almost got more work now. <laughs> um, because what we're doing is uh, attempting to um, uh, put uh, as much content of our um, permanent collection and our exhibition uh, stuff um, online so people can still make virtual visits and still kind of dig into our collections and enjoy them um, from home, or, um, however that uh, might be. So um, uh, at the moment, uh, we're sort of getting through by um getting our sort of past exhibition content um, out through uh, different channels so using our um, Twitter feed. We've, we've got a video of, uh, of the Enchanted Interior, which is kind of a nice like little highlights tour um, that we did very quickly before lockdown. But um, we, we were open for sort of, I think the exhibition opened for four days. <laughs> so we kind of, we had four days of, uh, of normality and then everything uh, obviously kind of changed. But um, no, we're doing our best and, and doing a lot of planning for, um, for how we can manage things in the future. So we've been, you've introduced a couple of things as well that I'm definitely going to want to ask you about uh, in terms of how virtual exhibitions are happening at the moment. But and also yeah. we're going to be talking about uh, the enchanted interior too. But uh, first, first I just wanted to kind of start off with by asking you a very simple question. Some of the people listening to this may not know about everything that happens in the art world at large, and so I I don't want to leave anybody out. Basically, this is the first time that I get to interview a curator as well for this series and so I just wanted to ask you how you would define the work of a curator I mean essentially I think the word probably gets um, bandied about and uh, abused somewhat and uh, it's one of those words that's maybe lost a bit of um, currency over the years where you know people talk about curating their um, their homes and curating a menu and you know it kind of and it, literally all it is is kind of um, uh, a series of choices that you're making. Um, it's the art of choosing well um, to be able to, in art terms anyway, um, tell stories to people. So what in my role, um, the, the job of curating is kind of starting with research to look at selections of works, artworks that you um, want to bring together to tell a particular story or to find out what stories it revealed. And then you have a series of challenges of what you can display um, based on, you know, if you're borrowing things from other collections, uh, you need to ha- there are sort of four dimensional puzzles that get thrown up with um, with this job. So you're constantly having to bear in mind in 
I mean, in, I guess in the old days, we had the, the challenge of physical space, you know, is the, uh, do the artworks fit your walls? Can you make them hang together in a way that makes sense? Do things look right together? But do they relate to each other? Do they tell a story? Um, do they make sense? So in a way, you're kind of a director um, of people's attention. So when you choose things, you you have to be able to justify why it's there, what it's saying, how it relates to the next thing. Um, and that relationship could be um, one of juxtaposition or opposition, as well as um, similarity. So it's a constant um, series of choices of uh, space and chronology, uh, theme, um, aesthetics. It, it's a kind of constant um, puzzle that you're trying to put together to make a satisfying whole so that when people come out of an exhibition or even a, a permanent collection um, viewing they have an understanding of why those things are there and they have um, come out remembering how things looked perhaps or they've come out with um, some sense of having been on a journey having been guided around a space and having their attention um, directed to certain things in a certain order and for a certain reason I guess that's as as full an explanation as I can give of quite a nebulous sounding job. No, that that was great. Yeah. And because this is the first time we talk, I also wanted to ask you, at what point in your life did you discover an interest in the arts and then also decided to pursue a career within the arts? Yeah, I mean, I guess an interest in the arts is probably something that you know you have as a child, um, whether you lean that way. Um, uh, you, you probably have quite a strong sense of being someone that... Um, that likes stories and visual uh, visual cultures and you know has has that kind of strong pull towards the arts. Um, I was one of those uh, sort of literary uh, people that probably always knew they were going to do an English degree because that allows you to tap into so many different um, things as well. So you're doing history and you're doing different theory and you're doing art history as well alongside. Um, uh, kind of so word and image I guess was always something I was interested in how those things related um but after a bit of time sort of experimenting with various jobs in media journalism and things I realized that probably my happiest moments um as a younger person were spent in um you know castles and country houses and museums and galleries and that those were the places that I wanted to be um, just to be in those environments and to be um, to have access to this amazing uh, history um, that exists in this country, and um, so I suppose uh, you know having having made that decision, I then started looking at how to equip myself with um, working in, in the museums industry, and I managed to get myself uh, in as a, a sort of um, information and education um, person at Keats House Museum. Uh, was my first museum job and I'd done a lot of um, you know you do your work experience and your internships at, at various places but then I, I sort of got my first step into the professional museums world in in, in Ke at Keats House which is also run by the City of London Corporation um, on Hamps near Hampstead Heath and from there I then sort of embarked on how do I skill myself up to do uh, a curatorial work that's really what I was interested in um, was the researching and the display um, and so I um, managed to get a role at Guildhall Art Gallery and I was mentored through um, sort of from the bottom of the ladder I suppose upwards by a very good uh, boss who now um, so Sonia Solikari was my was my boss and she now runs the Museum of the Home um, also in London which is um, a, fa a fantastic place uh, as well um, so, yeah, so I kind of professionalised myself, I guess, through um, self-teaching, through I did a master's, um, I did a, an accreditation through the Museums Association. So I'm uh, I'm one of those people that did it in a, you know, there is no real one route into this industry. I think you just have to follow your interest and hope that that sustains you enough um, and that you get the opportunities that's really, yeah, that's really what, <laughs> you know, what I would say. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. On top of being a curator, are you also a creator? In other words, do you create your own works of art? I'm an absolutely appalling artist. I have no, <laughs> no skills whatsoever. I cannot draw and um, I, I, I think I can write. But um, no, I think my, my skills and creation are, um, are verbal rather than visual. But that 
in 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 part in quite large part is why I love um art so much is because it's beyond my ability and it's and to me it's like magic it's it's a kind of um it's a skill beyond imagining um particularly sculpture I find you know for you um you see these amazing kind of baroque and renaissance sculptures um you know in Florence or wherever you might see them you know, or even in London, frankly, but um, you see sort of pieces of marble um, coming to life. I think that that is a particular skill I can't comprehend that humans have managed to learn how to do. So my respect for the art world is is enormous because I don't possess um, those manual skills of, of creating it. To me, it's like magic. I know this may be a silly question, but just for the sake of also transitioning into talking about the enchanted interiors and for the sake of the conversation as well, have you also always been interested as a curator in highlighting female art or for want of a better term, uh, women's issues in art? Yeah, I mean, it's. Just, I mean, women's art is is obviously a space that um, still needs occupying in in greater number and uh, and breadth. Um, and part of what um, we've uh, been, you know, we've we've been um, looking at and doing at Guildhall Art Gallery is expanding our collections to um, to speak to the art of today, to find um, where there might be um, gaps in representation or more um, need for those voices. So uh, we still, obviously we have this um, incredible collection of historic painting um, and there are women artists in that collection, but they reflect the culture of the times in which they were collected, which is largely uh, 19th century and pre 19th century. So they are largely male artists. But being in you know 21st century curation and having um, an ability to uh, add to our collections because it's an ongoing collection, not just a historic one that we look after, we add to it to reflect the present. Um, we found a lot more. Uh, women artists and BAME artists, sort of intersectional artists um, that we've that we've brought into the collections, and that's an ongoing um, concern of ours and priority is to really look at who's who's making work now um, and who is that work about, what community does it speak to, um, and how does it reflect the London of today. Um, so with, uh, with this exhibition, it was a, a perfect opportunity to um, open up more of a conversation about the place of women's art and the space um, that it occupies and um, the limitations that have been on it in the past that are now being pushed back and back. Great. So, I mean, I, I understand that this that the Enchanted Interiors is a major exhibition for the Guildhall art gallery mm. which i suppose makes it all the more heartbreaking to think that at the moment people cannot experience it in person too so but before we talk yeah. about it in more detail uh i was wondering whether you would be able to maybe say a few words about it to introduce it to anyone who has not yet heard about it yeah so i mean it's been put together originally um by a curator called madeline kennedy um for the laying art gallery in newcastle um and it's toured to us and we've adapted it um with her um to fit um our space uh and what it does is it explores the kind of sinister implications of a very prominent theme in 19th century painting so it's largely based in a victorian uh mode um but this idea of the the interior as a gilded cage where women can be confined um and you'll notice in victorian art there are often these women in very highly decorated spaces um depicted in this great sort of luxurious uh place and um but they're alone and they're there's always this tension between luxury and entrapment um which sort of reflects the kind of um the legal and marital position of, of women at the time as having to give up their freedom uh, and, and to sort of accept um, uh, an entrapment as, as, a, as a way of living. Um, so it looks at how that's evolved through the 19th century. Um, it takes in Orientalist and pre-Raphaelite paintings, which depict captive women, you know, damsels in these exquisite uh, interior spaces. Um, and it sort of challenges... Um, the Victorian fascination with passive beauty um, and brings in works by modern and contemporary female artists who can reveal the more complex ideas of enclosure um, and enchantment as a kind of um, spellbound limitation. And then it looks at sort of the home as a potentially dangerous place or and, and subverts that tradition of um, female figures as decorative objects because often women in those Victor high Victorian uh, pictures are 
displayed as though they're part of the furniture you know they're they're another thing another beautiful thing to look at um this sensuality and opulence um but there is a sinister idea that runs through it and this exhibition kind of opens that up for people and all the contemporary works in it are by female artists who are examining that idea challenging it um and pushing back to it uh, so I understand that the the exhibition is also split or divided into different parts too, right? Um, yeah, there are eight sections that um, that kind of gradually guide you through uh, from the Victorian captive beauties and harem scenes, which are particularly popular at the time, um, into uh, slightly darker ideas and of resisting uh, the enchantment and um, ways in which. Uh, you know, we start to add modern pieces to to sit with the historic works, um, and and so gradually by the end you have more of an understanding of um, a fuller picture of how women are being um, displayed, and then also how perhaps within these pictures the artists are conscious that this is um, a somewhat poisoned chalice, and this idea of the gilded cage is 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 kind of made more explicit as you go through the show. Yeah, and and I feel like I also should say that uh, it's not just paintings that are ex- displayed. It's also sculptures, photographs, and also works that blur the traditional boundaries between artistic media. So there's a uh, there's a yep, lot of artwork totally. there. Uh, and yeah, it's really a mixed media show. Yeah, mixed media show exactly. Yeah, uh, of course, pe- anyone who wants to know more, there is a great video on the the gallery's uh, website and I suppose also the YouTube channel. Uh, it's YouTube channel, so anyone yeah, listening to this um, can check that out. Yeah, the website's a really good resource for any information about us and yep, YouTube and Twitter as well. We've um, we've got some really nice uh, stuff coming up for our Twitter feed at Guildhall Art Gallery. Excellent. So um, there's a lot that I want to really ask you about this, uh, the, the, you know, the, the exhibition and everything. But the first thing I guess that I wanted to ask you about it was the motif of interiors, because... Would it be right to say that this is a motif that just enjoyed a great deal of popularity at the turn of the 20th century? And what, why would you, why is that? Um, I, I mean, I think as art was becoming more, um, pr- you know, there was there was a greater outpouring of, um, of artwork in the 19th century and it was becoming more democratised and it was kind of becoming less the preserve, I mean, it already had by the mid-century, I guess, become less the preserve of the... Um, the nobility and upper classes, and it had become a middle class pursuit. Um, and with the opening of art, sort of metropolitan art galleries, it also becomes something aimed at um, the working classes as um, as a way of um, kind of educating and entertaining. So what you see is a greater outpouring of pictures that are designed to be uh, bought by middle class people so in a way these um th- there was a greater obsession and a greater availability uh, of, of decorative objects and um, this is a, at the height of uh, manufacturing and um at the height of you know uh, trade and, and commerce for for britain in the 19th century from all over the world so people were filling their homes with these incredible objects um which were influenced by uh east african um sorry uh, sort of north african and um sort of eastern uh, in inverted commerce is um, design um, and people were making their homes these kind of enchanted interiors so it made sense for them to be almost looking to buy pictures of enchanted interiors to to put within their own enchanted interior so there's this real passion uh, for the home reflecting one's taste and it would be something uh, that people would want to show off and um, gain cachet through and fashion in, in interior design was was becoming much more of a an available concept to people who were you know the mercantile classes for want of a better word um so you do see that reflected in the in the art in the paintings of, of the time um this insistence on oh, soft furnishings and stuff they're great great collectors of stuff the victorians and i guess you mentioned it a little bit uh, earlier but i just wanted to kind of uh, i wondered whether we could say more about this how were women portrayed during this early period within this space and were there uh, female artists who stood out within this uh, early period and countered uh, the way in which the predominant way in which they were portrayed yeah, I mean, certainly you have, um, you know, the sort of um, the, the classic pre-Raphaelite. Uh, it's often it's often um, 
kind of put within um, mythology so you'd have these tropes that were very popular the lady of shallot um, is what you know you'd have the sort of um, passive beauties in, in in gorgeous spaces but um, you also have artists like Evelyn de Morgan who is a late sort of later phase pre-Raphaelite uh, woman who's um, very unconventional really um, and is putting images through that are explicitly challenging um, the idea that the sort of passive captive woman uh, is, is in any way a good thing <laughs> for anyone. Um, and so she, uh, in her painting, um, The Gilded Cage, you know, she, she explicitly calls this painting The Gilded Cage um, and puts an actual gilded cage in it with these birds um, in it sort of as a metaphor for the, the woman who's bargained away her freedom um, to be kept and looked after. Um, so Evelyn de Morgan is um, is kind of an early feminist, really, and she was a supporter of women's suffrage. She was someone who she was a pacifist. She was someone who um, believed in equality, and she married the ceramicist William de Morgan, who was also from uh, a kind of non-conformist, um, pro-equality family and background. And her whole um, philosophy really was that nobody was going to yoke her into into marriage and um, and force her to be subservient or passive. She wanted an equal creative partnership and a collaborative marriage and she found that in William de Morgan and there's two artists they they sort of sit together and they work together um, and neither of them sort of takes precedence and they they look after each other's careers and their own so in her work you see much more of this um uh, Victorian uh, the, um, fight back against the old um, traditional um, conservative with a small c way of thinking. Uh, so you see in her work something of that shift um, that will take on, that will take flight more in the early 20th century and um, sort of transform uh, p politics and and the way, and the sort of social um, way of thinking about uh, women's place. Um, you do also see other, you know, you see women artists at the time, Henrietta Brown and Clementina Hull and photographers like uh, Clementina Howarden kind of um, doing a very, some, doing something a bit different, um, particularly Lady Howarden. But, you know, she is a member of the aristocracy, so arguably it, it's not working women who are able to have artistic careers. It's still very much bound up in um sort of middle class and upwards, uh, probably, you know, all sort of nonconformist intellectuals who pursue artistic careers. That's it. Very interesting. And uh, I, I, while you were saying that about Evelyn de Morgan, uh, I was just thinking <laughs> relationship goals, you know, it's much better than the de Kooners uh, yeah. anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and lots of other are, 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 yeah couples in the art world and in art history so uh but i'm i'm also happy that you brought up evelyn de morgan i'm i'm a huge fan of hers and thank you for sharing uh, some some information about her especially with anybody who is not familiar with her works she's amazing and i did think about this while i was watching the video which is again a very interesting video uh, i thought it was great but i wanted to ask a specific question that might help understand what we talk about when we talk about perspective in a sense. Like this is actually something that you mentioned in the video. Uh, you highlight two works by De Morgan, one being The Gilded Cage from 1919, I think, and the other one being The Love Potion from 1903. And I know it may be difficult to describe without visual aid, but I'd love it if you kind of maybe try to explain to us why, despite the presence of some similar elements even within the composition of the work, including a woman by a window and all of that, in The Gilded Cage, the woman is trapped while in the love potion, the woman is exercising her freedom. What are the elements that allow us to draw these conclusions about these paintings? Yeah, I mean, the, the Gilded Cage, um, as the earlier piece, has, um, it, you know, it's very obvious uh, in that there's a there's a there's literally a world outside the window um that the um of people sort of dancing and this kind of reveling you know represented representations of freedom and and artistic expression and music and joy and you see the the woman who's trapped with her husband her husband is kind of sitting and kind of ignoring her um and she's kind of yearning to her her 
posture and her all her kind of energy is focused towards uh, almost trying to get out of the window. She's you know pushing towards this life outside. And De Morgan uses symbolism um, a lot to um, draw your attention to particular ideas. So you see that she's abandoned her her jewellery on the floor. So she's sort of um, uh, discarding uh, her her luxuries and that these things aren't important and won't stand the test of time. And also there's an open book on the floor. So we gather that she's been reading, you know, there's a there's a, an emphasis there on on education and, and this kind of covert acquisition of knowledge that women are, weren't supposed to have. Um, so it's all kind of the way that the composition flows. It's from the floor upwards, following the line of the woman out to the window. And then that sort of draws your attention to the top right hand corner where you have the gilded cage with the birds in, which are the, the sort of ultimate representation of confinement and uh, imprisonment. So, so there's a kind of flow to the piece that takes you from uh, from the ground up into the sky, you know, as, as if she's attempting to to fly, but her wings are clipped. Um, in the love potion, uh, it's again, it's as you said, it's a slightly different emphasis and this very um, flat perspective, which is you know quite late pre-Raphaelite, Burne Jonesy um, kind of feeling. Um, so what looks like uh, uh, was a woman in. A yellow dress um, with some sort of um, potion that she's mixing. And I think the, the original attribution of the figure was as um, a witch. Um, but she's not a witch because you look around the room and on her bookshelves. Um, so De Morgan loves putting women near books. I <laughs> think that's, um, that's a great sort of key into her thinking. Um, but her books are all sort of medical texts and, uh, and kind of um, suggest a sort of apothecary benevolence, you know, not a, a sp evil spell. So out the window in her room, um, uh, the love potion she's presumably mixing uh, it, there are there is a couple a young man and woman um so there's this kind of um it, and the woman in the room is not attempting to escape she is quite comfortable in this space there is nobody here to trouble her she's working she's um influencing the outside world from her room but she is the owner and possessor of that space. It's filled with her books, with her um, work as this um, mysterious, benevolent uh, magician of some of some kind. So her her window onto the world is one of um, empowerment in that she's influencing what's outside. She's not hiding from it. She's kind of um, doing her thing indoors, uh, which will then travel out into the world and have an effect on people. Um, so they're. they're different different modes of um of looking at of freedom and um enclosure in both of those works that's fascinating thank you for that i thought that was uh that was an amazing description of the works too i know it can be tough without the actual visual aid so yeah <laughs> yeah i've seen them quite a lot so i do hopefully remember them correctly <laughs> Oh, you know, uh, I'm so, I, I'm, you know, be mindful of the time because I can't believe how time is flying just uh, hearing you talk about all these works of art. It's just uh, <laughs> amazing. But uh, getting back to just, uh, you know, the idea of the predominant viewpoint in terms of uh, depiction of women within enclosed spaces, is there a period during which uh, women artists began to sort of prominently subvert this recurring motif of women in enclosed ornate interiors and if so was there a reason why that happened or something that prompted this to happen i mean i think it's it's kind of as as um as i was saying that, that it's happening it's happening in the later victorian period because it's mm. becoming more possible and women's education and, and women's art training is um is increasing there's much more of a um a sort of school um for you know women's education and professionalization is is occurring i think with the turn of the century and this kind of um new emphasis on uh, you know, voting um, and increased need for women's work that's brought about, um, you know, largely in part to the First World War. But there is a, you know, there is obvious towards um, equal recognition and, and you have various legal changes that happen, the Married Women's Property Act. And, you know, so there's a there's a loosening that takes the best part of a century to happen. So I'm not sure that there's a an explosion but you certainly see um with surrealism and the um you know, the 20s and 30s you see much more space for women artists happening and changes in the culture the loosening of um of those traditional uh, ties and and certainly the uh, 
um, more radical ideas coming to the forefront. You do get more women artists coming to prominence. But I would absolutely argue that um, we're still not really where we need to be. <laughs> Maybe we may have had, uh, we may each of us know a few female artists as household names. It will not outweigh the number of male artists as household names that we know. Um, so as with any change, any sort of paradigm shift um, that, that is tied up with so many complex factors and so many centuries of, uh, of, of history and, and tradition and restriction and um, it it takes it takes centuries for this to happen and we're still kind of at we're not really sort of fully in flight yet I would say we're kind of at a certain point in the liftoff but we're not yet kind of quite there um so you, you may see uh you know figures like Dorothea Tanning kind of uh, coming forward or even um photographers like Lee Miller or you know you we will you will have kind of these star names that that pop up but um but we're still not quite at the point where an all female show is considered uh anything uh, you know sort of normal whereas an all male show in the you know previously perhaps you wouldn't uh, people wouldn't perhaps question like where are the women artists whereas uh, now I think we have to um you know more shows like this that kind of push uh, and make space on the walls for um you know women have always been artists and poets and creators it is just about space yeah, you're so right about that. I definitely agree with that. And I guess this is uh, where exhibitions like this can help. Yeah, I, I hope so. And if anything, um, I'd love it for people to uh, to leave just with uh, one or two new names on their lips. If they didn't, uh, unless you're a real, um, uh, you know, art nerd, perhaps you wouldn't have, uh, you know, sort of contact with um, some of these these uh, these people. But um, if people could just leave thinking, oh, I, I love Maisie Broadhead, or I really like Shana Lutka, or I, you know, I had have an idea of Penny Slinger's work, I want to go and look at more of what she's doing, she's done. I think just having one or two um, new, uh, or kind of new people that you could then go and explore more of their work and their world um, would be a massive success, um, a successful outcome for the show. Fingers crossed. But uh, yeah, we've already been talking for about half an hour or so. I want to just dedicate <laughs> the last few minutes to, I know it's hard to believe, but I want to dedicate the last few minutes to actually talking about what's happening in the world now and how you feel like it'll change sort of uh, the situation for galleries in general. But I mean, I understand this exhibition was meant to run from the 13th of March to the 14th of June. But when was the decision yes. to move the exhibition uh, online taken? Do you remember when that might have been? And was it taken like in a rush or in a hurry? Um, well, obviously, you know, the um, the way that the closure had kind of came about, you know, we, we um, the, the city sort of took its cue from um, uh, government and, and other um, sectors. And, you know, we, we closed just a little bit before the lockdown. Um, I mean, mostly because, you know, we knew people weren't going to be traveling and weren't, um, weren't going to come and it was just the safe thing to do. Um, so we got four days of, of public opening and we had some lovely messages of people saying, oh, I knew you were going to close. So I, I, I had to sort of rush in and quickly see the show. Um, and then very quickly, um, uh, we'd obviously planned, we sort of, you know, there's all, with the city, it's always planning, always looking ahead. There's always, um, a sense of uh, you know next steps and and looking at contingencies and there's there's always a roadmap um, for for the city and um, so we you know kind of looked at who can we get someone in to do a video um, uh, just literally I think a day or two after we we closed and just before the lockdown so um, it it was kind of the uh, the the public tours that I would have done um, with with groups of people were given um, to a camera um, which was uh, a challenge but I think we we sort of got there um, and then yeah we're going to um, you know we've got a set of lovely installation photos for people to look at um, Madeline Kennedy is going to be giving a um, a talk that we'll be sharing through social media on the 27th of May, which will be a kind of deeper dive into um, into the work um, that she's put together and uh, these academic um, reasoning behind it. Um, and really, I mean, what we're hoping, um, obviously the situation's, uh, you know, flexible and we're planning for all eventualities, um, but um, as and when it's safe to reopen, 
um, we hope to be able to extend um, the show and to manage um, the gallery in a socially distanced and safe way, sort of taking on you know all the all the advice um, given given through government. Um, and obviously that's the the priority, and, and nothing will be done um, unless it you know meets all those criteria. So it, it's just a question of waiting and um, staying sort of light on your feet and being able to uh, adapt um, as and when we reopen it will it will be interesting to see um, you know who, obviously we want to provide um, our services and we're doing as much as we can now uh, through digital and um, online to still meet the needs of the communities that we serve um, and that will always be the priority for us. Yeah, I suppose once the museum's galleries reopen, there'll be other challenges to face, even just for that reopening stage, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And there'll, there'll certainly always be a, um, you know, there'll be a caution of of how that how that happens. And it will be, as with everything at the moment, you know, phased and staged and and kind of um, always with a safety first kind of priority. But I know people are, I know I am desperately missing <laughs> museums and galleries. And um, if that's uh, something, it's obviously not going to be uh, particularly soon, but it will be something um, there are, you know, task forces and, and the culture secretary sort of leading uh, thinking around um, the staged reopening of our culture sector um, and how we can manage it for the coming year and more well, I guess few years but yeah it's uh it's definitely um you know an interesting exercise in flexibility and adaptability so we're absolutely yeah hoping to to get to get things in some form um to have maybe have the exhibition uh, extended if we can and lenders are being very generous um, in working with us on that. well that sounds great and maybe we'll end it on this question because uh otherwise it's <laughs> you know we could we could talk for for another hour so i certainly could ask you more questions about the exhibition and more but <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or just nerd out on art in general. Um, you don't get to do that. Ver- I don't get to do that very much these days. I have to start a podcast to do that, actually. But anyways, <laughs> that's a different story. I think you've got the right idea, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just in terms of the Guildhall uh, Art Gallery, uh, would you say that virtual tours were something that the gallery was becoming increasingly interested in even before this COVID-19 pandemic affair? And do you see virtual tours and exhibitions becoming increasingly used by artists? Our institutions in general in the future, even when all this is over with. I, I imagine that's that will be the case actually. That having um, having found uh, the the you know as as with anything, necessity is the mother of invention. So when you need to do something, uh, you you figure out ways of doing it, and that's the great advantage of um, of the creative and cultural sector is that it, it adapts and it learns. Um, I think with um, with us, we we've been doing uh, as much online as as we could and then I think this just kind of um, made us think more uh, deeply about what works for our audience and um, I think there was a lot of discussion in the museum's world about not doing online and virtual gratuitously and not doing it just because and not kind of bombarding people with uh, with content that's not uh, thought through or appropriate or in some way um, you know uh, constructed to to meet the need um so the virtual tour was definitely something um that it was it was always like a an interesting idea that we hadn't uh, quite managed or didn't quite know whether that would work for us with this exhibition we knew there was an appetite um for people to see it. it's a very beautiful show and so capturing it on uh, on video and um beyond just installation photos is is a great bit of archive for us as well as a great learning tool for our visitors and a and hopefully a sort of um therapeutic and you know positive mental health thing for people to do just to kind of take a little break and look around but yeah all galleries and museums are, are obviously um looking towards that as a uh, as a future offering but I think it has to be sustainable it has to be um appropriate and it has to work for the audience um on the, it's the right thing for the right platform, I guess, is what we're all kind of thinking about at the moment. Well, with that, I thank you very much, Cathy, for uh, just chatting with me about uh, the exhibition no, and you. just start. Thank you. It was great. It's a pleasure. And I hope uh, I hope you're well in Prague and uh, <laughs> I hope you uh, managed to, you know, get out a little bit at some point um, and see some art again.